Good afternoon. Um, I'm Catherine Ragsdale. I'm a second year in May here at Texas Tech. Um, our panel is called Geography of the Body. Bodies are what we have left and what we leave behind at the end of our lives. Bodies ask things of us. To eat, to drink, to fuck, to feel. Things are done to our bodies. Violence enacted, clothes worn, CPR administered. How do we address the damage that we have done? According to KCBD, nearly 23 pounds of trash are dumped every second at the Lubbock landfill. Lubbock is 294 miles away from the nearest abortion provider. This group of writers is concerned with the way we write about our bodies, the way our bodies are read and misread, the way conservative politics affects that process, and how we confront the structures that we live in. We begin this roundtable with a series of our own work on the female body, and then a discussion of our work here. Our first reader is Katie Jackson. She's a graduate student pursuing her MA in creative writing with a focus on nonfiction from Texas Tech University. Her areas of focus include gender, womanhood, and social inequality in all its forms. Her current project uses historical context to consider how women in Texas articulate their own bodies, how often they are trusted to do so, and how this is represented in the public sphere. Katie Jackson. Okay, the first piece I'm reading is called Distraction or an Ode to My Cleavage. When I am 10, I forget to put it on before school. I have a hard time remembering to put it on, even remembering that I have a bra at all. I don't know what it's for. When my mom picks me up from school, she is frustrated with me. I can see your boobs, look, she says, when she stands me in front of the mirror. Everyone can see you. When I am 13, the boy I have a crush on sneaks into my best friend's backyard at a slumber party. I show him my boobs under a street lamp in the alley while he sits on his bike. When he asks if he can see down there and points to the zipper of my jean shorts, I say no. He puts his hand under my t-shirt instead. He kisses me with an open mouth and his braces taste like pennies. When I am 16, I get the part of Dorothy in a school play. Dorothy wears a strappy golden gown and gets to kiss the leading man. The climax of the play is Dorothy reenacting her lost pregnancy by beating herself in the stomach. The scandal of it is intoxicating to me. I throw myself on the ground and the lights fade as I retch and try to cry believably, clutching my golden gown. We perform at a contest, and I wait expectantly for the judge to give me notes about my big moment. It's very distracting, the gray-haired old man who smells like antiseptic says to me, for you to be bent over on stage, especially in that low-cut dress. When I'm 20, and I want another boy to like me, I buy a bra that advertises making me look two cup sizes bigger. It has thick padding underneath. It's like wedging a stuffed animal in my shirt. I wear it to a party where he'll be. We drink cheap liquor out of plastic bottles. When we play beer pong together in the smoky garage, I'm drunk. And I put my hands on either side of the table and lean over the plastic cups. He misses the shot. When the boy kisses me and grabs at me on the dusty tailgate of his truck, I know all he gets is a handful of cotton padding. He sleeps with me anyway. When I'm 24, my mom asks me what I want my wedding dress to look like. I tell her I want to feel pretty. What I mean is I want it cut like the golden gown. The first time I try it on, I tell her lower, and she takes it apart and sews it up with less fabric. She has to put three different support inserts in to get the look just right. He cries when he sees me. He does not try to hide the glances at the laced fridge neckline of my dress, and I feel lovely. I feel like truth. When I'm 26, I remember what my mom said in the mirror in fourth grade. Look, everyone can see you. I stop wearing a bra, and I hope she's right. And the second piece I'm going to be reading uh, is excerpts from my project about uh, women in medicine uh, from Modern Madness. <coughs> Quote, these disorders are most common to women and imitate almost all diseases. They complain of almost everything, although all not have the same complaints. For this very prevalent and distressing class of complaints, there is no remedy so much to be relied on as the habit of early rising. Dr. Henry Skinner, 1849. I hate Jane Eyre. I read it twice as an undergraduate in English and thumbed through it in graduate school, and I hated it more each time. My older sister is also an English literature diehard, and she loves Jane Eyre, and I think Rochester's a prick. She <laughs> says he's a product of his time, which, I mean, she knows more about his time than I do, so maybe she's right. Even so, he's still a prick. When I think of Bronte's iconic novel, I think of Bertha Mason, the mad woman in the attic who drug Rochester through hideous and degrading agonies, leaving him no choice but to lock her up and tell no one of her existence, like a psychopath. 
I've said it before and I'll say it again. He made her crazy. The 19th century was a formative time in medicine. Diseases like smallpox and typhoid were identified. The idea of mental health was developing. Doctors started to realize to wash their hands. Maybe it's Bertha Mason that makes me think of madness as this British high society thing, all lofty estates and insidious secrets, but it wasn't. Women didn't fare much better here. There's a list of reasons for women to have been deemed insane that circulates on the internet every so often, taken from contemporaneous hospital logs. Signs of madness, 1860 to 1890. Superstition, jealousy, egotism, masturbation. It's humorous now, those crazy Victorians. Signs of madness, 1860 to 1890. Women trouble, female disease, imaginary female trouble. When I started trying to find the words to tell the stories of the women that I know, I thought I would write about how people can be sick without looking like they're sick. But the more I talked to them, the more I started to notice a trend. Then I talked to another woman, and another, and another. So many stories about doctors in pain. One says, when he told me it wasn't that bad, I thought I was just being a baby. And another one says, I always make sure to take my husband or my son so they'll listen. They all say, I know my body, and I knew something was wrong. And for the record, yes, historically archived asylum laws have imaginary female trouble listed as a cause of madness. I didn't make that up. Signs of madness, 1860 to 1890. Softening of the brain, periodical fits, social disease. In the 19th century, doctors were only so willing to explore women's health. It was believed by many Victorian doctors that research of female subjects would be complicated and messy because of their hormones. It was more efficient to study men's bodies as the standard for healthcare. Some people today would argue that modern medicine is a wonder to behold and take part in, that we've come so far. Today, biomedical research uses male subjects in testing six times more often than women. Sadly, most of the research on the gender disparity in medicine speculates that the perception of women as emotional is a primary reason that their care is not taken seriously. Some male practice or some malpractice firms instruct women to keep their emotions in check to avoid a dangerous medical error. It's best if women don't things, make things messier than they already are. <coughs> Signs of madness, 1860 to present. Medicine to prevent conception, vicious vices, immoral life, nymphomania, suppressed masturbation, sexual excitement. The first tubal ligation was performed in 1880. Until the last 30 years or so, women who wanted to sterilize themselves voluntarily had to have written spousal permission. In Texas, a doctor can still refuse this procedure for any reason. The most often cited reason is that a woman will change her mind or that she's been coerced. You can't trust her. When contraceptives were first marketed in the 19th century, a series of prohibitions were enacted preventing the distribution of any obscene material. This included contraceptives, which were believed to promote lust and promiscuity in women. Today, contraceptive coverage is, is subject to religious exemption if a business doesn't want to provide coverage. You can't trust her. The prevailing idea about women who seek abortions is that they are promiscuous, irresponsible, lazy, or downright murderous. The rhetoric goes that, the pregnanc that pregnancy is a consequence of their action. Over half of women who receive abortions were on contraceptives when they became pregnant. The myth that abortion-seeking women are indiscriminate harlots who are too stupid to use a condom or take a pill has shuttered the doors of roughly half of Texas abortion clinics and continues to threaten the last one standing. We can't trust her. In the 19th century, liter literature in regards to the physical signs of rape relied on evaluation of women for intact virginity. Doctors were trained in how to determine if a woman had developed any venereal habits, which would disqualify her allegations from being valid. In 1990, a candidate for the gubernatorial race in Texas said that rape is like the weather. It's inevitable. You might as well sit back and enjoy it. When confronted about it, he antagonized the journalist and said, this is not a Republican women's club. It's a working cow camp, a tough world where you can get kicked in the testicles if you're not careful. You can't trust her. Signs of madness, 1860 to present. <clears throat> because some prick said so. This is the one part of Jane Eyre that I will never really erase from my recall. Since the medical men had pronounced her mad, she had, of course, been shut up. Rochester describes his matrimonial madwoman to Jane Eyre and brought to his novel as a misleading and maniacal idiot who suffered from being intemperate and unchaste. While many people hold dear the idea that we've made great strides in medicine, women still can't be trusted by medicine. They've closed the doors to the asylums, but they weren't ready to let us out. We can't be trusted. We're dramatic, hysterical. It's just imaginary female trouble. It's just a crazy chick's disease. It's just another mad woman. But we are mad. We say, we know our bodies. Something's wrong. We're pissed as hell.
our next reader is Maeve Kirk. Uh, she received an MFA in fiction from the University of Alaska Fairbanks and is currently falling out while pursuing a PhD in poetry from Texas Tech. Her work has been published or is forthcoming in Talking River, Permafrost, Passages North, Antipodes, The Bitter Oleander, and The Cincinnati Review. Hi, everyone. Um, let me make this work every time. All right, so today I'm gonna to read portions of a larger project, uh, which is basically a set of interlinked poems that alternate between some Georgic instructions for how to tame the earth, and also the voice of a female speaker who's trying to navigate those instructions. Um, so essentially we have two voices, and I'm only gonna read the first section of this, but just so we have a sense of what the piece is doing. Um, basically I have the voice of initially trying to go along with these instructions and trying to work within them. And as the pieces progress, she starts rebelling against those and trying to find a different blueprint to work within. Um, I wanted to read these um, particular poems because I think there's some parallels between the ideas of governing and working the land into submission and also um, working our ideas of what a woman is into submission. Um, in a lot of cases, we see efforts to try and reshape the physical landscape and also the feminine landscape into something that we would accept as opposed to what it actually is. So that was my point for this. Um, and since this is functioning kind of like a larger narrative, I'm probably just going to go ahead and read through. And so the way that it's structured, just so we have a sense, is we start with the voice of the female speaker, and then the instructions all have a title that um, start with like first, second, third. Saltwater mouth and the sound of rabbits twisting below brambles. This earth is humming. Moon-drenched, ground hum, the sugar-scented, split flesh of fallen fruit pulping between heel bone and earth. My hair tangled in branches like honey soaked, rabbits race into the thrumming darkness. Is anyone else capable of hearing? This hum, I swear, is telling me something essential, telling me a real true story. First you were there, and now here. Again you were there, and now here, again. Again, maybe you're only a broken trap line rolling below salt water to the edge of the plums. Maybe there is no there. Maybe the rabbits are drinking salt water now. Maybe the only place you can settle is here. Here is tangled expanse, is rabbits, is moon, is a humming, is never been, but remember, that one time you asked me if I really thought, does anyone do this? If I honestly thought someone would do this for me. And I'm starting to worry, yes, maybe yes. First, arrival. Arrive in the season that brings you here. Act like it was intentional. The first thing you must bury is your origin story. You were not brought here, you were not left. Harvest a new one, you arrived. To be a body in this space, you must be deliberate. Try to contain this driftwood impulse. Even now on the edge of the field, know your feet are cutting the dirt into an unknowable pattern. Your hands snapping the pink heads of milkweed and burning from their electric sap. If your skin reddens, call it a royal flush. The unruly overgrowth of dried grasses crush into a bow as you move through them like seawater pulled home. Marked the cracked dirt. Ground bees crawl humming through the lacework tunnels, the twisted plums at the edge of the stone wall. Imagine them all salt crystal steady. Imagine yourself salt crystal steady. Act like you know how to do this. There was a bus and I bought a ticket. Maybe a boat with salt crust on the bow, but still, I bought a ticket. I thought the water was yellow-green, and the road arched it back toward an expanse of slow-blinking towns hemmed in with fields. Is that good enough? Once my mother told me we couldn't be humans if Adam hadn't named everything that wasn't. If born into a world with no boundaries, we would spill beyond ourselves like water until we couldn't know our bones from plain dirt on the floor. I roll in, and each new town blinks a long, sweet pause before snapping shut. Maybe I'm cutting a trap line. Maybe I'm losing track of what is mine and what is the world. There are 108 steps from these plums to those stones, 12 to the brambles consuming the earth, 30 to the flattened stretch of soil. I think I can break into something workable. Second, cull, cleanse. You can't grow anything like this. Throat and fingers laced with debris. Know yourself as backbone and blade, as river water carving a hard line. Rinse the land of every system except your own. Bend the plum limbs toward soil. Strip down the wind-bruised fruit, the exposed pockets of blued flesh, a secret ripped open by starving swallows. Uproot the milkweed and dandelions, the tall grasses unversed in bearing anything other than themselves.
place bowls of cold milk laced with strychnine along desire lines that don't belong to you. Pit paint strips of cloth with honey and tar. Hang them from your orchards like prayer flags. Hold out your exposed wrists in the dark. Wait. In the morning, burn all the bodies you have collected, collected in this world. Let them ash, and so keep them forever. Their softened edges, translucent as mints melting on the tongue. Swallow. Look at all the space you've cleared. It's been days, and I have not learned the expected things. Should I be worried? I have not been reduced to a giver. Dirt in my mouth and the sour nectar of dandelion streaking skin. I can't stop consuming the field within this field. The, tangle, the dried tangles of sweet grass mouthing the pits of bird-scoured plums, crushed leaked water and the smoked air, eyes tracing the edge of milk bowl nested in the weeds, split eggshells, dried yolk on my nails, fingers dipping into ash and rising to the tongue for one more taste. Third, till. Inject a current. Hook the soil into a movement, an aerated churning. Indulge your desire to return, to walk a line that leads you to freshly upturned spaces. Everything hidden, exposed. The pale belly of it all, warm and light splashed. Examine the pieces of nature that offer you something. Little lessons in cartilage and bone. Split open the hives buried in the southern sand. See how each bee owns her own piece of the land. How they have walled themselves into their single nests, vibratory and ember furred. Pay attention to how, even now, as you remake their world, they will backbone themselves. Each sinking into her own adjacent, unshareable space. No letters, no calls, no attempts to lean and link bodies into one wreckage. No time spent in an open door, steady, silent, listening to the muffled hum of approaching wind beats cutting through the dark. A warning. Tilling can upturn everything you're trying to bury. Churns weeds into soil and scrapes their seed pod bellies awake. There is always a risk they will ignite and hook tendrils around the things you have buried, that they will drag shards up into the light. Ground humming. The bees they've dug back into this field. They've hemmed into namesakes, familial as their own soft gold pelts, building new heaps of dampened earth before climbing back into the belly of the land. Sun-soaked, I watch them sidelong, my hands full of sprouting grains. If they cannot imagine themselves gone, why should I? Imagine I find my shovel. Imagine I drop my seeds into the new burrows, claim I've carved them with my own fingers. Imagine the rice bloom. Imagine I drop the ash from my pocket and they eat it. Imagine they know and build me an apology through wing beat and hum. Imagine they sink and govern my pulse. Imagine they set my blood vibratory. Imagine they cut it with silence. A boot heaped, a boot heel healed the throat of their world. You told me to be deliberate. Fourth, grafting. Once you see grafting as the art of wounding, instructions will be replaced by instinct. Bring the plum tree, apricot, and peach limbs. Lean them against one another to cultivate a sense of need, a desire to collapse boundary lines and fold into spaces they don't inhabit. Carve a language of rupture, knuckle deep into the bark. Seal the limbs into a single body, set a timer, wait for the healing to take place. Wrap the tree in mud and dried grass. Carve your name in an exposed curl of root. Whether it is impossible to be impatient, Turn your gaze to new possibilities and see how far you can take this. Know that you can unmake and remake this field. Body the soil. Line rock shards into a spine and stitch tap roots into a network of veins. Let plums see the skin and the throat, the green blue wings of beetles, the eyes that won't stop moving. Know that you can unmake and remake the internal fields as well. Pour yourself into a snow cold creek, crashing, the atoms howling, and all the world close, close, so close. Hey guys, I'm Haley. Um, okay, so I'm going to be reading a prose piece, and um, yeah, okay. it is called May 7th, 647 a.m. through 7, or 801 a.m. You recall the sharp bend around the murky green lake that you're walking alongside mangled wispy trees with the flat, when the flat pathway becomes a steep dive. The thicket of non-native trees pa 
parts and there's a small clearing. This is where it is, Hell's Gates. There is a dam that floods every other year when the prayers for rain work. However, Lubbock is perpetually in a drought or on a burn ban, something you're entirely too conscious of as the boy you're with throws his cigarette down in the grass. You stamp out the curly, smoking butt with your shoes, just in case. The wind is unrelenting in West Texas. You catch a glimpse of one of the wooden windmills from the nearby museum. Its blades never stop spinning. This park is on the east side of town, which is another word for ghetto, or a lazy way of saying Lubbock is still segregated, but none of us want to talk about that, so we just all pretend the city stops at Avenue 8. You think of your boyfriend, at home, asleep, with the CPAP mask cutting into the park pockmarked flesh of his cheeks, and wonder if he will check your iPhone's frequent locations later. His accusation is choking out like ragged breaths. Your mother always said that evil smells like sulfur, and you think that's what you're smelling as you climb up the unpaved off path littered with deflated condoms, sparkling jars of beer bottles, and everyone else's trash. Um, the stench is bittersweet, and it stings your nostrils as the drugs you consumed start the inevitable drip down your throat and you feel the lack of sleep burning a hole in your head. You tell the boy you're with something about how you've never worn those shoes out before, and now you're wearing them at this park, where you come only when you're feeling dysmorphic and want your body to be beaten by its synthetic heels, because at least you're the one in control. But you don't tell him that part. You talk about your shoes getting scuffed instead. He calls you bougie. You laugh. He asks if you've ever been to Hell's Gates before, and you half lie and say, yeah, but in all actuality, you sprint past it every time you run this trail because your mother once saw something in the trees that she still refuses to name. He points to the abandoned, decaying wooden bridge that the hill leads to and asks if it scares you. You follow him, a lump caught in your throat. The wind is so cold that you can feel it on your face when the whole point of today was to not feel anymore. A text comes in and you see the name that you're avoiding, so you don't bother reading it because it's always the same. There's a steely barbed fence guarding the entrance to the bridge. You find an opening. You step onto one of the beams. Inhale because it could collapse under the weight of the body you struggle daily to come to terms with. The body you poke and prod and try to make sense of. Exhale when it doesn't. You sit and notice carvings in the thick wooden beams, initials of young lovers, and you wonder if they really did stay together forever. The boy ventures further onto the bridge, gently stepping from beam to beam, carefully avoiding the ones that had collapsed. You know, if he ever hits me, or hits you, you can tell me. You pretend not to hear him over the whispering of the trees. You feel the cocaine calm down starting, and you don't want to talk about what goes on in your glass house. So you leave the bridge and wander through the dying yellow grass, stumbling upon desiccated bird carcasses. They're so dry that they lack the stench of decay. They look as if life has exploded from their delicate, bony chests. You don't know why, but you can't look away. And he follows you now, and he holds your hand. We don't have to go back yet. We can stay here for a little longer. You open your mouth to say something, but your iPhone pings again, and again, and again. You look at the boy you're with, and you pretend that maybe this can be more, that maybe this can mean something. But as the wicked wind bites your face, you remember that he has a girlfriend, and you live with someone else. He drives you back to your side of town, the part blocked inside Loop 289 and you enter your range style and you listen. You inhale and you close your eyes, waiting for this beam to collapse. Thanks. Okay, uh, Claudia Diaz is a second year master's student concentrating in creative writing, specifically fiction. She's currently attending Texas Tech, where she also received her bachelor's degree in English. Currently, she's the treasurer of the Graduate English Society. She writes coming-of-age pieces where characters find themselves trying to reconcile their ethnicity with their identity and surroundings. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, so I'm reading uh, two flash nonfiction pieces and one um, poetry piece. Um, and the poem is kind of a visual piece, so I don't exactly know how we're going to read it, but we're going to get through it together. <laughs> um, so the first piece that I'm reading is, reading is called In the End. In the end, there's no evidence that anything was slipped into the drink except for a bill to the emergency room and a rough tongue. After you've been found unconscious in the bathroom of the restaurant, you're driven home where you lay in bed, waiting for the trembling that makes your toes, that makes you clench your toes to stop. When the shuddering continues, you're given two options. Walk to the car or be carried there because the vomiting has been going on for hours and it's July. You shouldn't be cold. 
You walk to the car carrying a wrinkled Walmart bag, trying to control the heaving of your stomach, but it continues. Your dad asks if you remember anything. How many drinks did you have? Did anyone touch you? Before the doctor comes into the office, he calls out, I'm going to check on Margarita though. And it isn't until the original tests come back without any traces of alcohol that his face becomes serious and he begins asking questions about your evening. It turns out that a lot of girls have been coming in with these symptoms, but on the night you came in, they flushed your system with fluids before they took your blood. There's no trace of what was in that drink. Okay, so this is the visual poem. Um, and so I'm gonna ask Jess to, or Jen, <laughs> hold this. So um, we're talking about gender roles here and um, the messages that are continuously given to women. And what really got to me is I found some really cool bumper stickers, uh, strange bumper stickers, I should say. And the main one that caught my attention was, um, don't let some scumbag steal your precious virginity. And so I thought that was a perfect representation of what kind of gender roles people are seeing every day on the highway even, that we don't even really recognize. So um, this is the poem. Um, don't let some scumbag steal your precious virginity. I want his humongous teeny on the tip of my tongue. I hear them calling, better stop now. A smile does a lot for your face value. Let's have a conversation. You don't have to say you love me. In the long run, I don't want to know your name. I want to dissolve as you drill issues into my bristly crest. Did you find heaven's coast with your eyes? I remember expressive sound patterns excerpts of orange bed sheets, a, house, a household god. A story of the year of magical thinking speaks volumes about a woman in a room realizing something. So all of those images on there are from um, magazines. There are wilting flowers. Um, there are women in jeans that are, are supposed to have the ideal body type. And I just think that we're bombarded with those um, roles every day and we don't even realize it. So I thought that that was pretty interesting thing, and that's why I wrote that poem. Um, my next piece is called Maybe Some Someday. I don't think it'd be hard to leave this life behind. I've had an alias in my back pocket for as long as I can remember. This girl becomes my daydream. She exists outside of flatlands, classrooms that are too tight, and the promise of another smile. She'd live on the East Coast in a single bedroom apartment where she and her cat would leave the windows open. A breeze would filter through the space, the cotton tapestry on the wall fluttering. The air would never be stale and undisturbed. She'd have a choppy haircut, short black hair, strands flowing across her makeupless face, and she'd save up enough money to open a small flower shop. Bulbs of fiery tulips stretching through the sun would line, would line the stand out front of brick layered building. Inside, snipped sunflowers would lay strewn across work tables, waiting to be gathered and wrapped in clear cellophane. The fragrance of ever-blooming saplings would scent her skin in the evenings. She'd grab a book and read outside. Calm. She'd be calm. There'd finally be time to sit in the spring breeze and fill her lungs with oxygen. The anxiety anchored in her throat is now gone, lodged free from the first breath of the new town. She'd be free of the unrelenting machine-like expectations of a place that she used to call home a place where productivity became her work. These notions always trailing, following her even into her bed, curling up with her under the sheets. Thank you. Um, so next is Jen Popa. She is a short story writer, essayist, and occasional poet. She, is current, she currently resides in South Plains, where she is a PhD candidate of English and creative writing at Texas Tech University. She's working on a collection of short stories, serving as a managing editor at Iron Horse Literary Review, teaching literature to a bright group of undergrads. Some of Jennifer's most recent writing can be found in Kestrel, Pithead Chapel, Juked Decom, and Colorado Review. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to read two pieces that are not sure if they're poetry or not. They started out as poems in one Curtis Bauer class, but I definitely published them as prose, so they're the tweener pieces. Um, okay, so the first one is American Gothic, um, and it was inspired by a weekend when I was really sick and I was driving between Austin and Lubbock, which is a drive I make pretty regularly while listening to Mary Shelley. 
um, and specifically Frankenstein, so multitasker. Um, so it begins with a line from Mary Shelley, which says, I saw how the worm inherited the wonders of the eye and brain. Father, one time I found you in a medical textbook in the face of Phineas Gage, the daguerreotype of a drooping eyelid, his skin a sepia balance, an 1848's most notable spark along a Vermont railroad, a tamping iron drives into the cheek's bloom, shoots behind the eye socket, and finds air, shucking the shell from the inside out. Photographed alongside his 13-pound impaler, the instrument which snuffed out gentle Phineas and procured a monster, locating personhood in a lobe. I find you after I drive six hours to Lubbock, Texas, through frayed curls of tire rubber, sawmills, taxidermy shops, a bus spray-painted not for sale, and oil pump jacks bowing at each other ad nauseum. A ritual started without realizing it was a ritual. Suspended on the plains between two homes that are not home, I find you in the crags of Ennui, places called Rising Star, Sweetwater, Zephyr, Ulana, Early. From a billboard, God says, I am bigger than the storm. In another, he says, it's hard to stumble when you're on your knees. My saying this would possibly embarrass you. You, dear Phineas, dear father, dear stranger split by iron, punctured medical marvel that you are, I look for you in the hollow but find an erasure. The humane Phineas we knew fled and in his wake we find your ugly chain-smoking mouth. You mistake my mother for iron and my face for hers. I stop counting Highway 183's abandoned dogs, shoelaces of saliva slinking from their jowls. I'm soft, I know that. In the heady waft of animal shit huddled among the buzzards, blooded beaks jerking at fatty ligaments, roadkill, in the rot of toothless barns, I find you. I am sure no father is aborted at full term without a reason, without medical necessity. Here, among lone sneakers and spiked paddles of cacti, I remember fashioning your shirts into nightgowns, folding myself into your lap, offering affections before I knew better. Before I saw it, a father in Tony from Who's the Boss, Charles Ingalls, Mr. Brady, a full house with three fathers, one for each daughter. In the north, you stitch seeds in your garden loam, care for your parents in the absence of your children, two images I cannot procure. You invent the slut to tell strangers how your ex-wife turned them against you, so women are irons, best left alone. Apologies do not fit in your mouth and bulge along the gums. I was never curious about the boy you were. I knew your name was another word for goad, for kindle. So instead, I imagine I sprung fully formed from the splitting scalp of my mother, you nowhere to be found. Hot rubber, hot buzzard, hot worm fizzling on asphalt. It's the worm and the not dead yet fathers who inherit the earth. And then the last piece I'm going to read is a piece of fiction um, slash poem um, that is entitled, There is no use believing in a god who doesn't believe in you. Loss is a dog gnashing its teeth, straining the chain looped around the oak. He arrives on a Tuesday after our big brother's long hair catches in the pool filter, winding and unwinding him for hours while we were at t -Law. We call the dog Sit Boy. No, God. Maybe Robbie. Mama says, you cannot name a thing that doesn't belong to you. But he is ours. Of this we are sure. We do not mind bared teeth or the hooked warning of his tail, or that he shakes the hens snapping their necks. Fat feathered purses litter our yard. He watches us pinch our noses and baptize each other in the algae pool, dunking and spitting arches. Our mouths taste of scum and dirt. Even so, we wail when Mama drains the pool and buzzes our scalps. The chain wears the bark bare until a blonde corset forms at the tree's middle and urine burns the grass tawny. All night he brays. Mama heaves her foot into his ribs. The drag of his teeth etches channels along her kneecap. 
She retreats, bandages her leg, pretends she is unable to recall what she has lost. Eventually, the dog's neck grows around the collar, swallowing purple nylon as Mama spills coffee on Father Fred and snuffles around the kitchen in our brother's size 13 Nikes. At night, she whispers, hello, to empty rooms, hoping for a ghost among ghosts. We pretend we don't hear her, go still in our bunks, but it's a routine that becomes as regular as nightly prayer. When the dog turns quiet, displays his pink belly each time we enter the yard, howls when we leave him, Mama ushers him through the back door. She unbuckles and tugs at the blood-soiled collar, cleans his wound. We're supposed to be asleep, but we place our feet in all the creepless spots along the hallway. We watch from the top of the steps and stairs, holding our breath, but Mama doesn't see us. She fills a metal bowl with pop peppered butter noodles, brother's favorite. They sit together while he eats, until she's told him of brother, tells the story of how he drilled holes into pennies to make them into bags, <coughs> how he used to talk to the people in the television. She says that his eyes were dark as figs. When the dog finishes, he licks at the wound where his teeth raped Mama's kneecap. She kneads his ears, milking them like udders. Curled around the dog on the kitchen floor, she thumbs the blaze of fur between his eyes and slips her neck into his mouth, as simple as tucking a letter into an envelope. A request takes shape in a sigh and a curse for her God. When the dog's teeth bear into her skin, red buds erupt, spilling to the floor. She does not play. from a nonfiction piece I've been working on since the summer um, about uh, nude modeling for art classes. Um, the painting I reference is The Kiss by Gustav Klimt. The tree is a body. Steadfast body, begging, flaking, wishy-washy, laundry day only when desperate, a Sunday afternoon of a body, an entire poetic tree of a body, sapling and knotted and kissing itself with its leaves. My body asks to have its thumbs popped, wants to lay on its stomach. My body makes its own kombucha, wakes up hours before it has to leave the house for work. My body is taking a personal day. It's eating sweaters in the closet while mom waits for it to come out. My body thinks it's in love, but it never is, so I will never be in love again. God, my body loves to be bruised because the body is a bruised God. My body wants to look you in the eyes and in the mouth. My body asks you, can I be a tree today? Can't I just be a tree? In a bar, a boy I kiss calls art modeling sex work. He jokes, so what you're saying is that you're a sex worker. Chuckles to himself and then takes another swig of beer. Somebody else later says, it must be so freeing to be naked without being sexualized. Sometimes artists will give me what they drew in class if I compliment them enough. I have a closet full of my legs, my face, and my breasts. A portrait of me hangs above my toilet. Sometimes, in the group of older people I model for, somebody will pull out their phone and take a picture of me. They don't know that what they're doing isn't okay. They don't even know how to turn off the sound of the camera. One class, the man sitting to the side of my body moves around with his camera and asks me to lift my head without asking if he can take the photos. I think to myself about how this man is an established artist, has a studio, gives classes, probably won't share the photos. I don't think about how he still has them, even if he isn't sharing. Much later in the same session, another man, one who shows up to haphazardly draw a boob and chat each class, asks if he can take a photo. His pen has been standing to the side of his chair for the last hour. No, I would prefer not, I say, and settle into the pose, raising my head so he cannot look me in the eye. 
Some art scholars think that the kiss is a reference to Ovid's story about Apollo and a nymph named Daphne. In it, Apollo insults Eros by saying he isn't fit to carry the weapons of a bow and arrow. So Eros makes Apollo fall in love with Daphne, and Daphne hate Apollo. Daphne vows to remain a virgin and is chased through the woods by Apollo. When he grabs her, she cries out in fear for somebody to save her, and her father Peneus turns her into a laurel tree. I didn't take off my red bra when I was raped. Once, when having a panic attack in the bedroom, my girlfriend at the time said, you always panic when your clothes are still on. And I thought, I always panic when I have to take my clothes off when I don't want to. I was sick of her pressing into me all the time. I was sick of her looking at my body and thinking it was something that she knew. This is what happens. I show up to an address that's sent via email. The house changes every week. I say hello and ask where to change, and I go into bathrooms or spare bedrooms to take off my clothes and put on the robe. The robe is like a lie or a play. Mine is silky and sexier than most people expect. It might be the most beautiful thing I own, and it always smells like my hamper from where I fish it out. I never take the time to wash it the way it's supposed to be washed, delicately. On breaks, I put the robe back on. In the classroom, that was when I would walk around to each easel and look at the way students had drawn me. The class starts with my legs, and at that point, the students don't know whether or not to talk to me. I hop off the platform, and they scatter as I move through the classroom. Towards the end, they work on portraits and are used to my body. They let me know when I have charcoal smudges on my ass, or they laugh because it's covered in bruises from hiking. They ooh and ah at how my dog has scratched a long, thick mark on my thigh. I start to think harder about the marks on my body. When I'm dumped by a girlfriend, I dig my thumb into my arm over and over until it is one black bruise. I covet the scrapes I get when drunk from table corners. One time, I show a friend one and he says, I know it's just because you were drunk, but give me a name and I'll take care of him. I tell him how stupid I think he is. I want to tell him, you wouldn't know. I wouldn't tell you. I would have to be in control of my own bruising. More than anything, I want to say, I wouldn't let that happen to me, but I have. Maybe this is how men turn women into trees, kindly. What gods want is worship from a distance. I want a hand on the wall of a cave, devotion and pigment. I'd like to turn my back and then twist. After Daphne is turned into a tree, Apollo suddenly becomes repentant. He acts as though he wasn't just running, as if he wasn't telling her to stop because she was marking up her thighs with briar thorns. He says to Daphne, since you can't be my bride, at least you'll be my laurel, and her leaves quake in response. I wonder if it's worse to be a tree because now she can be found, clipped, and grown again outside people's kitchen windows. Does a tree get tired? Sometimes I just want to turn my face away. I'm drunk. I'm in my friend's bed. I will have to change soon. I'm lying upside down, and suddenly I have to leave. I know I have to leave because my body is telling me to. I can feel it pinch and panicking. My body gets up, opens the door, and walks. I tell my body, what you are walking past are trees. I say, oak tree, con tree, live oak, magnolia, and my body starts breathing again, but badly. My body wants to breathe like a tree does, not gulping, but slowly and without a mouth. And then my last piece is a poem called People Keep Telling Me About New Mexico and Lubbock. It's about thinking you're pregnant. When people call out here big sky country, and I open my legs to it, really it's big nothing. Big quiet moment, and I say skipped, missed, waiting. The red in the dirt here is red for the same reason as blood, oxidized iron. I tell no one for a while and wait, then I tell the ones who would drive me over the phone and they say, well, let me know when we need to go to New Mexico. Well, I tell the man I barely know I'm waiting for rain. I say his name to him and spread easily like before. I hold him in the pit of my cunt. If I bleed, he'll thank me. He thanks me for telling him now, for making him wait too. Watches me drink a beer. It's dry out here, parched, red with dirt, not slick slap, sapped red, crimson. 
Nothing grows here, but everything has to grow. Thank you. Okay, uh, so now we're going to do our discussion portion of this panel. Um, and we have a list of questions. Uh, the first one that I would like to start out is, um, what ways are we seeing the female form rejected, either in literature or in music? talking about uh, in terms of uh, Lubbock and conservative West Texas being an abortion desert uh, and the lack of acknowledgement of independence or bodily autonomy or just like bodily dignity in a lot of ways. Um, I think that you see that reflected not only in the way that women are treated, talked to, legislated about, uh, but also in the way that uh, we handle the landscape. I think that um, women are, well, this is an obvious answer, I think, but um, whenever we don't, like, as Katie was saying, conform to, like, what we're supposed to be, whenever, um, as that bumper sticker says, whenever you don't put on a happy face, whenever you don't smile, whenever you shear off all of your hair, or you dye it a different color, or you choose, you choose anything else that isn't um, what you see in a magazine. And I think also when we were like talking about building this uh, panel of writers, like um, like conservative values like extend past like just like our bodies, right? Like we wreck the earth and we destroy like these images that are like Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's also like a really interesting aspect of living in Lubbock. It's it's not just uh, living with like the stigmas that like you're pointing out, Claudia. It's also like visually seeing and like the people living here in, in this kind of uh, standoff. Well, and it's kind of a double-edged yeah. sword, I think, yeah. in terms of like uh, the idea of like motherhood and domesticity and, and being uh, adhering to that, um, but at the same time, sexuality or um, sex before marriage or any sort of like uh, uh, sexual activity outside of very stringent guidelines um, is perceived as a way that uh, as being a bad one. Yeah. yeah. And on top of that, you see, like, Mother Nature. You're talking about Mother Nature. And if Mother Nature weren't nourishing, no one would, I don't think they would want to change the gender of that. And if Mother Nature were someone else, they would, was not nourishing, as I was saying. They just, sorry, I'm trying to, like, rephrase this, but, like, you're not going to change it. You're going to change the gender. If she's not nourishing anymore, and that's because why she's Mother Nature. And so, if you're not, you're going to reject her as a female altogether if she's not nourishing and comforting and all of those things. I also think that there's like the unique position of for all of us, like being in academia and having um, often being like the body in the classroom. I think is also something that's really complicated. Um, um, I think it's been a week of just like hate, <laughs> it's like speaking to this, but just having students kind of questioning you um, in ways that like with the same lesson or the same thing that like, uh, you know, heterosexual male counterparts are not being questioned. Um, and even this week um, I got some hate mail through like just rejecting them all, right, um, and being questioned specifically because I was a woman and like that was why I didn't get it. Um, so operating in, a, in certain Like I think like that reduction is rooted in that expectation. Like I I am expected much more than like my male counterparts to be extraordinarily sympathetic to my students mm -hmm. and do emotional labor, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Like I'm happy to do emotional labor for my students to a point, mm -hmm. but I think like I you know I've had friends who have gone through like their masters without ever having to walk a student to the counselor. Well, it kind of goes along with that idea of, you know, like this landscape as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're expecting to get a specific product out of women, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. well, I'm going to you for this particular mm -hmm. thing. And as soon as we aren't giving that particular thing, it's almost like, well, we've got to move you back into this space. Mm 
Yeah, no, and I think that that's interesting, particularly um, in my research with women and how they handle medicine. Um, I was shocked to find out how many women actively seek out other women for all of their medical concerns, just because there's there's an understanding uh, in the way they, in the authority you have in that space, um, that I think is made problematic in certain parts of the Do you want to answer the question? Okay, so our next prepared question is, how, um, how could we build a female writing community? Um, and what does that look like? And what's the difference between a writing community inside of academia, which all of us are, or outside of it? any work that we're bringing to the table, even if it's not, um, and what we're already doing here is just already having an open discussion about um, about everything, about um, driving on the highway and looking at these bumper stickers and like allowing us that space where we're not going to be um, ridiculed for having those ideas or um, allowing, and I think all discourse, but like allowing anyone's religion and or lack thereof to be a part of that conversation and to see how that builds your your writing persona. Yeah, and I think if we're talking about like building communities, whether it's inside or outside of academia, like I remember we're having a conversation with Chris where it's like, how do you tell somebody that their poem's not working, right? How do you tell somebody that you respect that their poem's not working? And I think like that that initial impulse of respect is where we get there, right? I think um, not gatekeeping poetry or experience or academia, because I think um, I've certainly seen people's poems shut down because they're not quite there yet. Um, and I've seen that happen to women more often than not in workshop, um, versus this, this idea of having this space to work on something. I think I often show up to readings like this, or I show up to workshop, and I'm like, it must be absolutely perfect um, so that I can move forward instead of letting it be like a collaborative, um, shifting space for my work. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that you talk about, because you and I have um, taken a workshop together, and uh, I, you know, I write about women's issues a lot, and it's about sexuality and women's bodies, and things that might make my grandmother uncomfortable, but, um, <laughs> I think that it's important for me as a writer, especially, to have women in those spaces to uh, get it, you yeah. know? Which is not to say that that uh, the men in my class are incapable of getting it, but the, the conversations that I have with women about stories like this are always enlightening and really comforting and really encouraging. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, not to give too much away about our pieces, but we both wrote them at the same time yeah. in the same workshop. And I, I think. Like, Katie, your responses to my pieces were, like, obviously different than some of the other responses I received. Like, one of the responses I received on my piece was, you know you're beautiful, like, you don't have to write about how you're not beautiful, which is not, like, the point of that piece. Um, and I think, I think, like, it's helpful to have women in these spaces to say, I've also experienced this. Because, like, I, I read about men all the time, right? But, like, there's, like, this, like, this, an endpoint to empathy, right? Yeah. Um, it's not all sure. No, that's interesting. In that same workshop I had, I had a comment that was like, why aren't men in your piece? And said, well, it's about <laughs> I think it's about kind of um, cultivating. Like, I think in terms of, you know, I was really, really lucky in that when I first came to West Texas and was like, why is what is this weird place? Why are people like pushing my grocery cart to my car? Like, am I, like I don't understand what's happening. Um, and I've been from Austin and Alaska, and so I was like, this doesn't normally happen. I don't understand. Um, but I had this group of women who invited me to join the writing group, and it has been transformational in terms of how I understand how a writing workshop can work. And I think that it's um, genius in that it's really limited. It's a group of four, maybe five people. Um, and it's kind of this space of we're going to call each other out, but we're also going to be incredibly generous um, and try to see the, the spaces that we are missing um, or the, the blind spots that we have. And I think you have to be 
be in that space and to have a really like well cultivated group of women who, if you're looking for a female writing group of people that you just like straight up trust that are going to call you on your on your bullshit and are going to um, help you see the piece um, in a way that's maybe I wouldn't. There are things that I think I brought to that workshop that I've not brought to a class. Brought to a class um, because I didn't feel like that was a safe space and I didn't think that I was going to get the same feedback and they, that's usually been pretty bright. So. Mm -hmm. Next question. Okay, this one's fun. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I grew up here. I grew up in, in 30 miles down the road in a rural part of Texas, um, and it wasn't. I, there, was, there was just no. <clears throat> I think, thank the Lord that I grew up with a family that kept me kind of in healthy spheres. But uh, you know, I was back when we were in middle school and we were learning about sexuality. You know, women were compared to dirty toothbrushes, and I'm told that you know. <laughs> Once they have sex, they're dead for, or they're done forever. They're dirty. They're bad. Um, and I'm, I feel lucky that I've been able to overcome that um, in my personal life. But I also know tons and tons and tons of women who can't, or haven't, or um, still don't feel comfortable with it, um, because it is systemic and perpetuating and subtle and yeah. yeah. And I'm also curious that you have like three members on the panel who like came into West Texas from not West Texas, like what's the difference between like, like not necessarily sexual expectations but gendered expectations from where you came from to here? I mean, even things that seem really innocuous in terms of choices that you make with regard to your wardrobe that are commented on, um, mm -hmm. like it's, it's interesting too because I don't, I guess I had ideas about, you know, especially from students giving feedback on um, things that you're wearing in the classroom or whatever, I assumed like this is all men, like men are leaving comments or whatever, but I've started having female students saying things and I'm um, going like just like little things like it's been eight weeks and you've only worn dresses. It's like, that is true. It was student observation. Like, I, I don't know what to do. Like, cool. Like, um, which it's not like a hypersexual comment necessarily, but it's these moments of observation that you're like, why are you watching me so closely? Um, and why is my body being placed in this way? So, yeah. And just to kind of build off that, like, I agree, Alaska had a very different vibe. It did. It yeah. definitely did. <laughs> <signified. laughs> But I mean, I would say in terms, like I'm originally from a really small town in Idaho, we have 2,500 people, so I would actually say like a lot of what you're talking about is present there for sure. But I also agree like um, since moving to Texas, I think that there's also a lot of that tension that is definitely directed at like, what are you wearing? How are you navigating these spaces, right? In a way that's maybe a little bit, are you smiling? Yeah, are you happy? Yeah, somebody asked me the other day if I was upset, right? I'm just walking down with, with a normal blank face. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot more focus on like an external, display of what we're expecting what we look like in that space, mm -hmm. I think. And I, I think like I think private space is really apt way to describe it because I think for like um, like for the like gay relationships like I've cultivated here, right? Um, it's almost always exclusively private. Um, mm -hmm. to the point where like in some situations like I'm not even able to come out that I'm in a relationship with a woman or I, I feel less comfortable um, being in a coffee shop, sitting next to the person I am dating, um, because I think there's a lot more scrutiny about like this this tension between how we're being observed. Um, well, and I think that that also, particularly in terms of like um, gay relationships, there's also like this. Uh, 
assumption in some areas that that's performative, right? That that's not like genuine care between people. It's just you know um, attention seeking or, or whatever crap. Uh, but that also, but of course, you know, none of us would agree with that. But then it still factors into the way that you manage that relationship in the public space, yeah. which. I think that like, we had, we almost, a lot of us had mother figures in our mm -hmm. um, pieces. Um, so how did mother figures factor into our discussion of the environment um, from the female body to mother? We already have talked about this, but the role of the mother is interesting in literature. I think just in my own work, it's interesting, because I read about my mother a lot, because when I was growing up, um, I think that she was very much doing her best to initiate me into this hyper-conservative part of the country. Um, but as I've gotten older, I mean, I've, I always say she's a little woke, of course, but like, and this is, you know, only in my 30 years of life, but it's, it's crazy to me that somebody who I consider to be very um, authentic and generous towards femininity um, only 20 years ago was mad at me for not wearing a school. You know, like, I think that those things are changing and moving in the right direction, but I still think that, like, particularly for mothers or motherhood, it becomes problematic as to, like, how much of a service am I doing you to start to not warn you about these things? Yeah. You know? I also think that there's this very strange spectrum that we all live on, and, like, these day-to-day -day basis, and, like, like, where we are and everything. So growing up, my mom was like, okay, you need to learn how to be able to do everything you have, um, everything you want um, without a man by your side. Like, you need to be able to do this. Like, you need to be able to change a tire. You need to be able to, like, cook your own meals. You need to be able to provide for yourself. As, like, a married woman who's been married for a really long time. But, like, also, how do you find yourself trapped in that role? And then now, whenever I come home and I am not in a relationship or I'm not doing these uh, things that, like, my friends are doing, or whatever my female friends are doing, then it's like, hey, so like, are you gonna, when are you thinking about starting to date again? Mm -hmm. Whenever you've had that role, say, okay, well, you've already had this spectrum established where you, where you were told kind of not to. So like, where do you fall, and like, what day is it gonna be appropriate to have maybe a boyfriend, and like, what day is it not appropriate to rely on this person, mm -hmm. or partner? I also, I don't know if I'm crazy, I do about writing, but like, <laughs> but like I, I think like sometimes like that like expectation like when I'm writing I, I think like okay am I only writing about having sex or ha like being a mom or like having a mother like are those like the two things that I'm capable of writing about because I think often like my entry point and what I'm thinking about is like this like extreme version of femininity that I feel absolutely trapped by and then I feel absolutely trapped by like my subject matter that I like am choosing because I'm interested in it. But like I I fear being pigeonholed. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody else feel that way. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that and I think that we're gonna talk about but as a, as a crazy. <laughs> we can, we can um I, and I think that my red and I think that when I write unconsciously a little bit angsty about it, right? Yeah. Like I wanna drop F bombs and I want people to be made a little bit uncomfortable or people um, to at least be made to think a little bit about like what femininity means. Um, but yeah, then you also run the risk of being an angry female writer yeah. who's, you know, preaching, um, which is not the intention either. So it's yeah, no. Should we skip to the question that says, what's off limits? What are you trying to wander <laughs> around? Because I feel yeah. like we've been hitting that. Um, well to build off that, when I was thinking about this question, I actually I think writing about just emotion in general, right? Because that's something that I think is always level that I'm aware of is like, well, at what point am I putting too much emotion on the page? Because I feel like I have to place mm -hmm. that to a certain extent, or if there's mm -hmm. too much, it's going to sound just like, it's not like it's yours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like it's your book piece, it's mm -hmm. your diary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I think in terms of like how I'm displaying emotion on the page or how I'm conveying that is always something that I feel like is kind of off limits to a certain extent, where there's mm -hmm. constrictions around it. Well, also like something interesting, because Francine J. Harris came to talk last week, and she talked about Bob Hickok's poetry, and she, she said something about like distance in Bob Hickok's poetry, and 
like, oh my god, how do I ever reconcile like me desperately wanting to wanting to distance myself from the leader, but also having like a lot of emotions about this mm -hmm. thing going on. Um, yeah. So So whenever we talked about this, I think we talked about like um, certain things that we were feeling uncomfortable about reading out loud. Yours was like the word cunt. Yeah. You um, did it. You did it. Good job. Mine was like talking about doing cocaine at Mason's. Surprise! Surprise! <laughs> and I can't remember yours, but oh, I don't. I don't know that I actually said what. I don't think so either. We were just like, how do we do this? Like that. Yeah, which like kind of ties back into like the way that we feel policed. But, uh, yeah, I did it. Your mom's going to see that I talked about cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> and like, back to my mom. And like, one of my favorite, we, we already talked about all this stuff together, but like, one of my favorite parts about this conversation is like, we were talking about like, okay, like there's like this expectation of all femininity, right? And then there are all these things that we're doing that are like outside of that expectation of femininity, like mm -hmm. saying the word cut, or like doing cocaine, or like, um, you know, like, going to a private loan or something like that. And all of those are like, you know, like I, I think that sometimes like they're coded as masculine. Mm -hmm. Like men, men could walk along the train tracks alone and it's like a kid rock novel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, like, but for me, like I always be like, oh no, I'm like touching some line that I'm not supposed to touch. Yeah. And I think that's like an interesting thing because to me like, um, like maybe saying the word cunt is inherently feminine, or like like um, doing cocaine is the most feminine you could be, or like why why do we need to like even describe these things as feminine and masculine, right? Um, why do we need to like code everything we do? Well, and I think it also goes back to the idea of being likable. You know, as much as like we don't want to admit it, you still want to be likable. You still want people to like what you're writing. You know. And um, it's just like this ingrained thing to where if I'm not, uh, if I'm pushing back against that, that makes me inherently less likable, no matter the quality of the writing or the ideas or anything like that. I feel like there's a big um, push with regard to like sentimentality, right? Like that's a word that is thrown around either in workshop or Thank you all so much for listening to us read and we say the word kind of at least three times. <laughs> <laughs>